a reading from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. If you can have my iPad slides, please. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is God's word. So today we begin a series on image making. It's the first of our six core values, as you know, that we've been talking about quite a few times this past year. And that's because here in PPCOC, we believe that our identity as individuals and as a church family comes from God. We are who He says we are. And as God is, so He has made us in His image and His likeness. So that wherever we go and in whatever we do, we may share His goodness, His purity, His life-giving nature. And we find that the story of Scripture is all about how God creates images of us. He creates images, He creates His image in us, rather. And the story goes that no matter how much humanity seems to mess up our calling to be God's images, God works to restore that image in all of us. And it culminates in Him sending Jesus of Nazareth to be the perfect image of the invisible God on our behalf so that through Him, the image of God in all of us might be restored as we partake in Him. So we'll be spending the next five weeks on this series and it happens to take us through what Christians around the world would call the season of Advent. As a church, we don't observe the Christian calendar for ourselves, but we see it happening all around us, right? Uh, Orchard Road is now all lit up. Great place for sightseeing and being a tourist in our own country. Uh, we hear all the shopping malls start to play Christmas music, even though it's still November for some reason, right? And um, we see we're all really making our shopping list and so forth, right? However, Advent is not Christmas. If Christmas celebrates the arrival of Jesus on earth, this season that is called Advent is what happens just before that. It is the season of anticipation, of waiting of being expectant of something great that is to come. And for us, that something great is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect image of the invisible God. He has already come once, and we look forward to His coming again. And in between now and then, we live in the in-between, between His first coming and His second coming. We are a people in the process of being perfected. We are a community of God's creatures on the way to completion. We're not there yet, but we are on the way. And that fills us with a certain kind of expectancy, of anticipation, of there's something great that's about to happen. The question is, how does it look like to live with that expectancy, to live with that sense of hope? In this series, we'll be going through stories in Scripture where the people of God are living in that in-between space, where they're looking forward to something that is promised, something that is to come. And we're going to see that for these people in Scripture, accepting God's promises that this thing is really going to happen wasn't always very easy. We're going to see that people will turn from fear to hope, from unrest to peace, from despair to joy, and from hatred to love, because they are filled with this expectation that God is going to do something in Jesus of Nazareth. And I pray, brothers and sisters, that their stories will become our stories as well. Some of us come here today with 
various kinds of fear, unrest, maybe even despair over our careers, that we might never be good enough for someone to hire us. Despair over our families that for some reason we just cannot seem to get along with. For aging parents, for whether we have enough money to retire and beat out inflation while we're at it. Whether your peers are actually gossiping about you behind your back. And maybe you've heard the Christian response before. Just pray harder. No, just trust God. Have hope. Things will get better one. And you've tried to believe that time and time again. And every time, you've been disappointed. Because somehow, your prayers didn't seem to get answered. At least not in the way that you were hoping. Today, I want to say that we see all of us. We see everyone here who carries a story of hurt, of hopes that were dashed. And I pray that today, you will find comfort in the stories of Scripture of people who were hurting intensely and how somehow God showed up. This is the Gospel according to Luke. And we'll be reading from the first chapter, verses 5 to 25. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as a priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. Skipping down a few verses. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. This is God's word. Let us pray. We give you thanks for the stories recorded for us in Holy Scripture, O Lord, our God. O God, who is almighty and everlasting, in whom we live and move and have our being, O God, in whose image we are created, we pray that we recognize this wonderful blessing and privilege that it is. We recognize that we come from a world that often tells us otherwise, that we were not that we are not good, we are not beautiful, we are not beloved, we are not cherished, we are not worthwhile. And we come in need to hear a word that reminds us of who we are and whose we are. Grant to me today the gift of story and of imagination as we explore the story of Zechariah and how we see fear transform into hope and despair and hopelessness into expectancy. Bless the word this morning as it is presented for the sake and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever felt 
absolutely and utterly useless. Have you ever felt that you were dead weight, like everyone around you was just tolerating your existence? I remember that when I was in primary school, I had this conspiracy going in my head that everyone, that my parents had bribed all my friends and all my teachers to be nice to John Lim because I was like, how, how come everyone's so nice to me? I don't think I'm very nice and like, people should like me. So I, I, I really thought that everyone was just tolerating my existence because I knew that somewhere deep inside, I wasn't a very good person. And maybe it was just my eight-year-old brain going wild. But for Zechariah and Elizabeth, whose story we just read, it wasn't just a feeling. It was basically a fact reinforced by their society. You see, they were living in a culture where, especially for women, the way to be of value and use to society is to add people into that society, namely by giving birth, by upping the birth rate and so forth. Conversely then, if you and your spouse could not have children, you would be useless, especially the woman. Elizabeth in verse 25 of Luke chapter 1 says that her reproach was taken away after she had conceived, which means before that, she had lived all her life being reproached for being barren. Now, I'm not a parent myself, and so I can only imagine the kind of struggle that some couples go through to become parents, some of whom are sitting with us today, and how devastating it must be to try for years to conceive and fail, or to conceive successfully and never hear that baby's first cry. And in those days, if that tragedy alone wasn't enough, there was an entire society looking down on them, thinking that there has to be a problem with one of them. It's one of their fault for being infertile. Some would push it even further, saying that one of your must have sinned, or both of your must have sinned. That's why God punishes you with infertility. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth were just an old couple waiting to expire because biologically speaking, there isn't any hope for them. And that is the background of Zechariah's situation when he is called upon to go into the temple. Because Zechariah is a priest. He is from the tribe of Levi. And on this particular day, he has a very special role to enter the temple and to burn incense. Now, that's a very special, specific reference that is only ever given to one other person in the story of Scripture, which is the high priest, according to the law of Moses. Once a year, the high priest is allowed to enter into the most holy place of the temple and to offer up incense upon the altar of the Lord. And so, when we read the Hebrew Bible, we know that the high priest is dressed in a very particular way and goes through very specific rituals for this purpose so that the high priest can be the idealized version of humanity to represent all of humanity in God's presence. The high priest wearing robes that make them look glorious and mighty and powerful the high priest is meant to be the perfect version of humanity the ideal image of God full of glory, full of goodness and life. But on this day, a human being that gets chosen to be this high priest-like figure, because he's not the high priest, but he represents humanity in the temple, this supposedly ideal human being, ideal image of God, is aging, infertile, lifeless, he and his wife. He's supposed to be the ideal human being, and I feel like we might know this experience in our own lives, this experience of hopelessness, of being called into a task where you feel like you're not up to it. The experience of going through the same routine day after day after day and feeling like you're not getting anywhere, that you're just languishing, that your days are spent going through the motions and you're never growing or making a difference in the world. And there's a fear that just everything is going downhill and there's nothing you can do to change it. And in fact, the more you try, the worse it's going to get. I think of my friend Jack, not, not his real name, but he was a friend in secondary school, um, a friend I got to know while I was in secondary school. 
and we caught up recently. And of course, we're talking about life. How's it going for him? How's life treating you? Where are you now? And he kind of hangs his head. And he says, you know, I've been, you know, we're in that stage of starting to start our careers and everything. And he's like, I've been sending out resumes and emails to countless companies. I've had few replies, fewer interviews, and zero offers. His family is not the best family situation either. And his response, where, when I asked him that, man, that's, Jack, that's really hard. Is there anything you can do about that? Are you looking for, um, how are you passing your time then? What keeps you going? And he says, him being a child, um, a follower of Christ from young, he says, you know, trust God, Lord. What else can I do? There might be something to affirm in Jack that, even in this low situation, he feels like, okay, I can at least trust God. But you know that kind of tone when someone says, I just trust God, Lord, what else can I do? That's a man who is at the end of hope. Someone for whom perhaps trusting God comes out of maybe habit, wanting to say something that sounds spiritual, but who really doesn't experience it as something hopeful. God hasn't changed the situation, hasn't made his life any easier. Would any of us be filled with, you know, exuberant joy that, wow, I've, I haven't gotten a single job offer, but, you know, I trust God and everything's going to be okay. I don't know many of us would be able to do that. Many, many of us, I think, would resort to this, almost as an option of last resort. But it's not just those of us who have tasted failure and rejection. Others of us have tasted more success in life, maybe, than Jack but there is also a kind of hopelessness that successful or people who have tasted success can experience. I read a book recently that contained interviews of people working and living in Singapore. And this is what a special needs educator in Singapore had to say about her experience. Now, she's moderately successful. She is in a place where she is able to, um, where she has worked hard People are being changed by her efforts. People are taking notice. Her school is taking notice. But this is what she says. You know, the more things you do and the more that the school sees it, the more money you get. Great. But it is never enough. You always end up having to do more. It's also very competitive. I don't think I earn the money I deserve. In my opinion, the system is totally messed up. By the way, that, she didn't use the word messed. Unfortunately, we don't have a choice since this is how the system works. I really hate it. Even those of us who are successful can run into this trap of climbing a corporate ladder and find that it's just a rat race in the end. It's just a pursuit for the next thing. And that's how the system works. This is a sentiment of someone who feels resigned to whatever fate they've been placed into. And I don't know how this really is in this person's situation. Don't even know the name. But I think that we all can relate to this feeling of how no matter how much we do, it's never enough. There's always going to be someone more handsome, more pretty than us. Someone who has a better marriage. Someone whose kids are more well-behaved than our own teenage hooligans. Someone who drives a better car. Someone with a higher salary and less work. Right? Someone who just seems to make it in life. And like Zechariah, we can rise up to the highest, most prominent role in the land and still feel like we are inadequate, helpless, hopeless. And any success we enjoy is just going to fade away. What happens in this story then? Zechariah is told by the angel Gabriel that he and Elizabeth, despite their old age, will bear a son. The infertile couple and the barren womb will be fertile and life-giving once more. Life will arise where there was once only death. Now, Zechariah, of course, he struggles to accept it, right? He responds, you know, how shall I know that this will happen, seeing as me and my wife Elizabeth are already so old? We know from the angel's response later, but that Zechariah was just not, not having it. He, was not, uh, he did not believe it in what the angel said. Zechariah was asking, you know, how is this going to work? The mechanics of biology don't allow for this. 
Note the angel's response, however, if you're looking in your Bibles. Zechari- uh, the angel Gabriel's response does not answer Zechariah's question. Zechariah is asking how. How is this going to work? The angel responds instead, not with how, but with who. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. In other words, Gabriel is saying to Zechariah, do you have any idea who you're talking to? I'm not just any messenger, just trying to give you a, you know, a, win, uh, a fanciful idea. I come straight from God's throne who made you and every cell in your body that you do not even know exists. And you think that you can doubt the word of God that I bring to you? You see, the basis of hope is not how, but who. Zechariah's hopes and expectations were founded on biology. The angel Gabriel reminds us that we should be focused on theology. Not how, but who. It's not about what you're going through, not about your problems and limitations. It's about who lives within you. Because when we know whom we have believed, then we know that any how becomes possible. And as it turns out, Zechariah and Elizabeth do go on to have a son whom they name John. New life emerges in the barren womb and everything that Gabriel proclaims about the son becomes true. Remember how we said at the start that Zechariah in offering incense in the temple was kind of like a high priest figure? The supposed best of the best that humanity could offer and yet he was not good enough? Well, with their son, Given by divine providence, he and Elizabeth have been truly made complete. The image of God in both of them has been brought to completion. Death has been reversed into life. Barrenness has given way to fertility once again. What's important in this story is not how that happened. We could investigate, you know, how, how does the reproductive tract work when you're age 70? That's not the point. The point is, it is God and His Spirit who made it happen. It's not how, it's who. And this is the essence of the story of God throughout Scripture. The story of a God who makes man and woman in His image, and in spite of their failure to live up to their image, in spite of our failure to live up to their image, our image-making God works in mighty and powerful ways that defy even the laws of physics and biology to restore that image in all of us. So brothers and sisters, do you place your hope in the how or in the who? Do you hope in your own abilities, strategies, resources, talents, or do you hope in another? You and I are created in the image of God. This week you have received messages that tell you something else. You may have seen commercials and advertisements that tell you your life is not complete until you buy this item. Black Friday has passed already. Cyber Monday is coming up. Uh, Christmas sales are about to start. Your, your life is not good enough until you have all these things. You may have felt the pressure of society measuring you by certain standards that make you conscious of everything that you don't have. You may be aware of rumors that are spreading about yourself by your colleagues, by your peers, and they never dare to talk to your face about it, but you know it's happening and you feel like you're less. It might be family members who tell you that you're a failure, verbally or non-verbally, because they point out every little thing that you do wrong and never point out what you do right. Please hear this message today. Hear the truth about who you are that every single individual in this room is made in the image of God, created to be good, pronounced by the Creator Himself to be the crown of His creation. We are beloved. And yes, though we are broken and flawed in many ways, the God who created you and me loves us enough to bring that brokenness into healing and restoration. This is the source of our hope. Not in how we can fix ourselves, but in who can fix us.
It is not the same though as optimism. Optimism, sometimes interchange with hope, says everything's going to be okay even though I don't know how. I just, I just hope only. I just wish only. Hope, biblical hope says everything's going to be okay because I know who I belong to. Optimism only looks at the situation. Hope looks at a savior. Now, hope does not make things right overnight. In fact, Jesus says that when we follow him, when we place our hope in him, life is going to get harder. There's a cost to discipleship. We have to take up our cross and follow our Lord and Savior into death. But what we get in exchange surpasses all understanding. Peace, the ability to remain calm under fire and courageous under pressure. When we place our hope in who instead of working out the how, we experience joy unspeakable that no trouble or trial, no hurtful word or gossiping colleague, no despairing ruminations when we let our heads go wild, nothing can overcome the love that is born to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Those of you who know me know that I'm a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings. And for those of you who have not partaken of this glorious story, the story is basically about how two small people try and destroy a piece of jewelry and a lot happens between point A and point B. This is Samwise Gamgee. He's one of the two small people called Hobbits, right? And he's not the main character. He's a servant to his master Frodo Baggins. And there's a scene where they are in enemy territory and they are separated. And Sam is desperately trying to find his master to complete the mission. He's running, he's hungry, he's tired, he's running out of food and water. He's running out of time. And all, for all he knows, his master is already dead. And so, a passage from The Return of the King. This is not in the films, by the way, but this is how it is described, his situation. At last, weary and feeling finally defeated, he sat on a step below the level of the passage floor and bowed his head into his hands. The torch that was already burning low when he arrived sputtered and went out, and he felt darkness cover him like a tide. And then softly, to his own surprise, there came at the vain end of his long journey and his grief, moved by what thought in his heart he could not tell, Sam began to sing. And the song progresses for a while, and this is one of my favorite lines in the whole trilogy. Sam sings, Though here at journey's end I lie, in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, above all shadows rides the sun, and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. Sam does go on to find his master. And the story continues. But this scene stays with me for the beauty of the language and for the way it presents this idea of hope. If, he, if Sam is focused on the how, how's it going to work out? How am I going to find my master? I'm one man, one hobbit in the midst of enemy territory. If he looked at that, Sam has absolutely no reason to be hopeful. There is no reasonable how that can get him out of the situation. Of course, Sam doesn't get to a who yet, like we have. But even he realizes that there is something beyond. Beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, beyond all shadows. He realizes that there is light and beauty high above that no shadow can touch or taint. And even if his situation doesn't end, though here at journey's end I lie, even if his mission, his quest is a failure, that something beyond will endure. Maybe that's what matters. For Zechariah and Elizabeth, their story didn't exactly end perfectly. It's not recorded for us, but one day, they will taste the sting of death. If they lived long enough, they would have seen their son, John, cruelly beheaded by Herod. These human beings, these images of God, still will taste suffering 
and end and old age and perhaps even the horror of burying their own child. But the story doesn't end there with them. Because not too far away, as the promise is being made to Zechariah, there is another image of God being formed in the womb, not of an aged woman, but of a young virgin woman. An image of God whom the son of Zechariah will point towards. This will be the true and perfect image of God who will become the eternal high priest of whom Zechariah was only a shadow. And this image of God will taste torment and death and every human suffering imaginable and emerge victorious. And He calls us to place our hope in Him. Not in the how, not in abilities, talents, resources, but in Him. I want to close with this story. Some time ago, in the early days of my own ministry here at PP, there was a day when I felt incredibly hopeless. I felt like I wasn't doing anything, or nothing I was doing was contributing to the growth and the blessing of the church. It felt so frivolous. And I remember it was the end of a long day and I was on my way to another meeting. And I don't know how I put this playlist together, but it came together. And I hit play, and this was still during a time where we had to wear masks on uh, everywhere, basically. And as I listened to it, my mask became soaked with my own tears. These songs didn't change my situation overnight. I still felt the same way. All, all the same issues still persisted and existed. But what was common in those songs was it changed my perspective. They did not offer me... Th there's a few ways that one in a state of hopelessness, I think, can choose songs to listen to. One is songs that are angsty, full of anger, and just screaming at the whole world and how messed up our situation is. Option one. Option two, those happy-go-lucky songs that make you escape a while from the difficulties of this world, but they, even the songs will end and you will re-enter that world. What these songs did to me, one of which we will have the joy of singing together in a while, proclaim the reality that we live in a giant chasm between ourselves and God, a mountain so high that we cannot imagine climbing up. And in desperation, we turn to heaven, the only place where we can possibly find our solace. And we cry out the name of Jesus Christ. My perspective shifted. And I spent that whole bus ride realizing that it's not about me, my service and my career, my, the rest of my life can potentially amount to nothing and it will be okay because Jesus is still king. He is still in charge of all that goes on in this world. And if by my life and all my death, I can contribute to that mission of God for even one moment, then it would have all been worth it because this world is in the hands of a good God no matter how broken it may seem. Brothers and sisters, what is your hope based on? What are the stories that we tell ourselves in the moments of our distress and our despair? Do we try and stock take? Okay, what are my options available to me? How can I fix this situation? Or can we look past all of that how and put our hope in the one who invites us to hope in him? Hope in one who will never ever die, who will never leave us or forsake us. One who went into the grave and came back out the other side. One who invites us to share in His living hope. Let's stand and sing.